for signing and verifying cryptographic signatures. Uh, I wrote this tool for OpenBSD project about a year ago uh, in order for us to verify end-to-end -end integrity of our releases. And so this way, when you download OpenBSD and install it, you can be assured that the OpenBSD you're installing is the OpenBSD that we built uh, back in Canada. Um, so uh, the okay. So we had some alternatives, uh, which I guess other people use. Uh, OpenBSD for in the beginning had been using uh, SHA-256 checksums for all the downloads, but that's not the checksums themselves were not signed. However, so anybody who could maliciously interfere with the download would be able to also maliciously create a new checksum. Although the checksums did were useful for detecting accidental damage, like if you the file was mangled in transit somehow. Um, so I think um, one of the ideas that people kind of floating around was to use HTTPS. Um, I don't think nobody in OpenBSD ever really seriously considered this. Um, but we had been using FTP, and we were moving to HTTP. And so a lot of people assume, hey, HTTP is insecure. You should use the secure version of HTTP. Um, now, the problem with this is first, uh, like I mentioned, we wanted end-to-end -end security. So what gets built in Calgary or wherever the build machine is, we want to make sure that that artifact is the same artifact that ends up on your computer. Um, Using HTTPS only ensures that whatever the mirror sent to you is uh, what the mirror intended to send to you. Sorry, just um, before you go on too long. Oh. You actually also need to have this one. Okay. Nope. All right, now I have, oh, oh, now you can hear me. Okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, so start from the top, or was I talking loud enough to... You guys kind of got, I didn't really talk about anything important anyway. Um, <laughs> so, you know, and also a lot of our mirrors are run by friendly people, but they're not necessarily run by the project. Um, and so we can't necessarily tell everyone, yo, you must use HTTPS and, you know, buy into that yourself. Um, and second, it puts all of the mirrors inside this giant uh, circle of trust where now, the attack surface to compromise OpenBSD is basically any, you know, is all of the mirrors. And so that's just too much for us to guarantee. Uh, and third, uh, I personally am really disappointed with the certificate authority CA model. Um, and so um, it's not necessarily required to use HTTPS, but I think most people, when they say, oh, HTTPS will make it secure, you're implicitly buying into the CA model. And uh, the OpenBSD project would prefer not to delegate final authority over what constitutes authentic OpenBSD to like 400 random people scattered around the world that we've never met. Um, and so, and if you're not going to use CAs, then why even bother with TLS? Um, I'll get to discussion of what Signify is, but it takes more code for a TLS client to negotiate hello and do the key exchange than an all of Signify. So, uh, and I mean, for us, uh, I know people joke that we still use floppies for the installer, um, but Signify had to fit on a 1.44 megabyte floppy. And for us, I think that's not so much a matter of, like it really needs to fit on the floppy, but the floppy, is a good way of, for us to measure how bloated the system is becoming. And so if you can't fit it on the floppy, then maybe it is too bloated. Um, so now the only real viable option, I think, is uh, PGP or probably GPG uh, if you want open source. Um, I hear other operating systems use GPG or PGP. Um, I. Uh, my concerns with this were complexity, quality, and complexity. Um, <laughs> so uh, 
Uh, there was a PGP usability study done some number of years ago. I don't know if you've heard about this. They put a bunch of technical people, um, experienced computer users in a room with a computer, told them to set up PGP, and two hours later, uh, none of them were ever seen or heard from again. <laughs> so uh, now, in most cases, uh, as we'll see, the, no, the end user is never really going to actually interact with Signify. But nevertheless, uh, I wanted to make sure that if anybody you know, decided to peek under the hood, you would be able to like, reconstruct the complete workflow uh, from signing or from key generation to signing to verification on your own uh, just by reading a man page uh, that fits on two computer screens uh, you know without going too crazy so uh, and also uh, we wanted to ensure all the code involved in signing met the OpenBSD projects uh, quality standards um, and without digressing too much about code quality of external code, I'll just say that it's easier to have control over quality when it's in your tree and you own it versus importing code written by other people. Um, now, the complexity of the code is also a major factor here. Um, as oops, I need to switch. as uh, Matthew Green is a professor of cryptography asked, uh, can someone who built GNU PG 2.1.1 on Debian, give me a hint on which libgpg error you used. Um, so this is a question which I did not feel I myself could answer. I don't know which libgpg to use. Um, and this comes back where even if a perfect PGP code base exists, we have uh, no way of verifying that this code is actually perfect because there's just so much of it. Um, and so. The uh, answer for us was to start from scratch. Uh, I'll let you look at that for a while. Um, so um, the, uh, oh, I forgot, I'm, I'm missing, sorry, I'm missing a slide here. So you have to just listen along. Um, so we have a bunch of decisions to make. Um, first, um, but we can, by thinking ahead about how we're going to use this tool and uh, knowing that I was going to end up implementing it, um, I can look ahead and so, I, you know, if our choices are like A, B, C, or D, um, whichever of those I pick, I know I'm definitely not going to pick E, all of the above. Um, so Signify has uh, very few features and wherever like another tool might offer you a choice, Signify certainly only offers one option. Um, so among the First things, uh, the first thing we need to decide is we need to pick a crypto algorithm. Um, and for Signify, we're using ED25519 uh, signatures, which, uh, so ED25519 is the Edwards twist variant of the curve 25519 um, curve developed by Daniel Bernstein, DJB. And uh, basically, so curve 25519 uh, is used for Diffie-Hellman uh, key exchange, but you can't use it for signatures. So for signatures, you need to do something to the curve, and then uh, you can sign stuff with it. Um, now, the ED, I'll talk a little bit more about this, but basically the, some <coughs> code for ED25519 had a couple months earlier been imported into SSH, um, which actually made this very simple vetting process for me. Uh, instead of looking at all of the signature algorithms that were out there, I looked at the newest one that had been most recently imported into SSH, uh, vetted that it was going to be viable for our implementation, and went with that. Um, so I kind of built on choices other people had made. And so I didn't like look at uh, like, you know, I don't know, there's 12 or more curves um, out there in popular use, but I just kind of, we'll pick what, whatever the newest thing in the SSH is, we'll assume that that's the best, um, and so we'll use that. Um, then the next comes to the plumbing, uh, what metadata to include in keys and signatures, uh, what, made it not, what metadata not to include, and uh, the interface. So we need to sign things, and uh, we need to verify things, and how many command line options can that really be? Um, so, 
the okay so before I get to the files again uh, a little bit a few more notes on the, the signature scheme so one other uh, really nice feature which kind of sold me on uh, ED25519 is it's a deterministic uh, signature scheme and so most variations of DSA or ECDSA uh, require random nonce and that has failed spectacularly uh, in a number of cases where people need a 256-bit random number and if you actually only have a 255-bit random number uh, your signatures end up being, uh, it's easy to recover the key. Um, or you repeat the nonce because you're not quite sure what you're doing. I don't know, PlayStation 3, uh, anybody? Uh, so the, um, instead what ED25519 does is it hashes the message and uses that as the nonce. So if you sign the same message over and over, it's going to keep generating exactly the same signature. And if you sign a different message, it's going to use a diff it's guaranteed to use a different nonce for a different message. And so this way, there's no repetition, and there's no way to get the key back. Um, so that was pretty slick. Um, you know, and also, the DGB designed the curve um, the parameter is such that uh, implementation, it's easy to make a fast, efficient, and secure implementation. Um, you know, so basically, you take everything that we've learned about uh, digital signatures in the last 20 years. Um, look at all the things where if you had like a giant checklist of like these are the 10 things that you must not screw up, ED25519 basically makes them impossible to screw up. So it's pretty slick. Um, now the only complaint uh, that one might have is the security margin uh, is like estimated like 128 bits. Um, and so you're like, oh, that's not good enough for like 50 years or whatever, um, you know. And so yes, it's on the small side compared to some other curves. Although we're talking about like heat death of this universe versus heat death of all of the universes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I, like I think that, like it, that's probably good enough. Um, and now even if you are like super super paranoid about this. Uh, the good news is Sinify keys don't even need to last that long. Um, I'll get to our key rotation schedule, but basically a Sinify key is only ever in use for one year. Um, and even if you were to somehow come up with a scheme to break uh, Sinify keys, uh, five years from now, being able to forge signatures for like OpenBSD 5.7 current release is not going to do you much good. Nobody's going to be installing OpenBSD 5.7 in five years, I hope. Um, and so uh, this is kind of unlike, yeah? Is that key expiration length, is that uh, configurable? Or is that uh, uh, so I'll, I'll get to that, but it, it is actually, the keys themselves never expire. Uh, we simply stop using them. Um, and uh, but basically, so this is unlike breaking an encryption key where I could go back and read 20-year-old secrets, which you know, in theory could be valuable. Um, but uh, signatures generally don't, particularly the way we're using signatures, they don't need to hold up nearly as long. And so it's okay uh, if uh, people start breaking them as time goes on. Um, but this is not to say that I think these signatures will be broken. Um, it's just kind of if we need to change, if we need to move on, we can move on, but it won't. There will be no long-term lasting damage. All right. Finally, caught up with my slides. So, what does a Signify key look like? Uh, it looks like that, maybe. Um, it's a QR code of uh, the guts of a key. Uh, you can take a picture of it if you like, and then somebody can take a picture of you taking a picture of a QR code. Um, and so, you know, um, now one of the nice things about these keys is they're pretty small. Like we can shove it in a uh, QR code. And so this way, if you don't trust that the Signify key on the website um, is valid, or if you don't trust that this key I posted on Twitter is valid, or if you don't trust that the key printed on the top of the CD that you got in the mail, because that got interdicted, uh, you don't trust that, you, you, know, you can always come to a BSD conference and take a picture. Um, and now everybody has the key, uh, assuming you trust your camera's image sensor firmware, you know, so. Uh. What if the, the NSA 
implanted someone in your room while you were... Yes, I mean, I, I have not verified that this cable, uh, you know, connected <laughs> to the projector is uh, <laughs> secure. So, uh, actually, let's look at a, like a real file here. So, this is actually the entire contents of the Sinofi Omisi 5.7 base pub key. So, we have a little file name... Uh, organization system. So it says it's OpenBSD because that's like we're, we kind of do it like vendor version and then thing. And so there's a base key, uh, there's a firmware key, and there's a package key. And they're all from OpenBSD and then this is for the 5.7 release. Um, now, uh, so there's two lines. Um, and the first line is kind of weird because it says untrusted comment. Um, then it tells you what it is. But then it also tells you not to trust it. Um, so the, the comment is there because in case you lose the file name or you know, like it gets stuck on like a MS-DOS file system, so you have like openb tilde1.pub or something, um, you know, you don't know what it is. You're like, okay, so this is the key for 5.7. Um, but um, I think if you look at the like, history of cryptographic schemes, uh, in addition to implementation errors, there's a lot of human error where the... I mean, at some point, the, the person uh, at the, the end user has to verify OpenBSD, and I felt that that was always going to be one of the weakest links. And so, uh, and if you look into, like, what people, you know, how you trick people into believing something, um, generally, if I give you some random file and I'm like, yo, this is a legit key, you're not going to believe me. But if I say, here's a key, look, it says OpenBSD in it, you're going to read that and be like, oh, look, it's legit. Um, and so people are much more trusting of what they read than, um, and see for themselves and what other people tell them. And so I kind of wanted to give you a hint here that just because a key says it came from OpenBSD doesn't mean that it did come from OpenBSD. Um, and then there's uh, the next line. So uh, the next line uh, for, is always going to start with capital R, capital W. Um, because the, uh, if you decode, it's base64, if you de de decode that, the first two bytes of the decoded text are capital E, lowercase d, um, which is our way of indicating, excuse me, that this is a ED25519 uh, key, just in case we ever need to change it. Um, the algorithm is embedded in the key. Then come eight random bytes of data, which are used to detect accidental key, um, and signature mismatches. So if you try to verify a signature with the wrong key, uh, normally you would just get an error saying verification failed. Um, but that might alarm you unnecessarily if you uh, used the wrong key by accident. And so instead, uh, there's these eight random bytes which will just say, hey, there's a mismatch here. Um, you need to go find a different key or a different signature um, to get a match. And then uh, the next are the 32 bytes of the actual key. Um, and the, if you look at a .sig file, um, a Sinify signature is exactly the same format, um, except the signatures are 64 bytes long. And so that base 64 line just kind of carries on a while longer. Um, and so, sorry. Uh, for reference, uh, that's the FreeBSD uh, security officer key. So if you want to take a picture of that uh, <laughs> and you have a zoom lens, uh, you can see if you zoom in enough there. See, that's, it's a PGP key. Um, I just kind of wanted to throw that in there just like, it's, I don't know, you know, I don't know. It's on, it's on the website for FreeBSD, but I don't know like how else they distribute that um, where I think the, the small size of the Sinify keys uh, allows us to just basically put them everywhere. Um, and then it makes it easy to distribute. So uh, now uh, the command line. So uh, actually, uh, I should have included an example command line. But um, the, uh, You can read the man page. Uh, <laughs> so no, but uh, so the initial debate um, when I first developed the tool was, you know, kind of like uh, whether we should use positional arguments or not. 
And so uh, a lot of other tools in Unix that you're probably familiar with, like CP and Move, uh, have positional arguments where you have the destination or you have the source and then the destination. Um, and then you have some extra options. Uh, Signify does not take any positional arguments. Uh, all arguments are specified with flags. So it's dash M for the message, dash X for the signature, dash P for the pub key, dash S for the secret key. Um, and so I value uh, explicit verbosity over uh, implicit mistakes. So, um, you know, for the most part, Signify is embedded in uh, shell scripts and, uh, or Perl scripts in the case of the package tools. And so you're never, people only are typing these command lines out like once or twice. And so uh, you only have to get it right. But then when you go back and read it, if you haven't looked at the man page for a while, you want to make sure, you want to see like which is the secret key, which is the public key, which is the message. And you don't want to have to guess uh, based on the position. Because um, you can try to come up with like uh, a system in your head, you're like, oh, well, I'm clearly signing the message with the key, so the message comes first. But then someone else is going to think you're going to use the key to sign the message, so the key comes first. Um, I don't know, like, I can't use LN without reading the man page every single time. Um, it's exactly like coffee. Yes, and that somebody explained that, and I still got it backwards <laughs> in my head. Um, so. <laughs> um, the, uh, so, I mean, basically, uh, you know, this is just kind of like foolproofing. It's like, okay, so it takes you four more seconds of typing, but uh, I can, well, I can't guarantee you won't make a mistake, but I can guarantee that if you are looking at the command line, you will be able to verify uh, and understand what all of the arguments are. Um, so I wanted to mention uh, artifacts. So uh, I mentioned, so, Generally, in crypto speak, we talk about messages. You sign messages. Um, but uh, that's a little vague for us um, just because, I mean, you might interpret a message to be anything. Like, so, I mean, like random emails that I send to the mailing list are not signed, um, they are not artifacts. Um, and so, what we are using Signify to sign and verify are artifacts. So, this is the releases, the packages and patches, basically things that go onto uh, what were FTP uh, mirrors and are now HTTP mirrors. Um, but it does exclude the website um, and uh, BSD can talks and slides and everything else. So uh, basically um, we are at the current time only signing like open BSD. We're not signing all the stuff around it um, because, uh, well, currently the signing process is somewhat involved and involves like Theo going up and down a flight of stairs and uh, into the, the secret vault room and so forth. And so uh, he's not going to do that like every time somebody like updates the web page, um, you know, and so forth. So um, the, uh, I guess the, the moral is like, you know, the, if, it, if, if you would consider like the thing that you're downloading to be OpenBSD, you should make sure that it's signed. Um, if you're just reading about OpenBSD, uh, I don't know, don't believe the internet. Um, <laughs> so, uh, okay, so what are we actually using Signify for? Uh, the first, the installer. Uh, if you've installed OpenBSD recently, you've probably noticed the installer uh, where it downloads and installs sets that's now been split into two phases where it downloads all the sets, then it verifies them, and then it installs them. Uh, it used to just kind of stream FTP data into tar, um, but you don't want to do that if you're not sure what you're streaming. Um, so uh, the install shell verifies this. It's all pretty transparent. Um, it'll complain if the signature is invalid, but otherwise uh, it's always going to verify it. And the, uh, and the public key is embedded in the installer uh, in the BSDRD RAMDIS kernel uh, file system. And so uh, the installer basically, it, it's self-contained. It has everything you need. Um, now, what we're actually signing is the SHA-256 checksum file. That is, uh, so that was previously uh, what I mentioned earlier that we were using. And what we, so we're not signing like the giant base 
56.tgz file. Uh, we're, we're signing just a checksum. And so uh, this is a lot smaller, um, makes it a little bit quicker to verify, and then also uh, simplifies things on our signing end where we build it. But basically, this establishes a chain of trust where if the signature on the checksum file matches, then you know that the checksum file came from us. And if the tar set uh, has the same checksum as in the checksum file, then you know that the checksum or that file is also the same file that we checksummed. Um, you know, so from us to you. Uh, the only uh, component that you need to van manually verify is the installer itself. Uh, and there's a couple ways of doing this. Basically, like the BSD RD kernel, if you're going to uh, do an upgrade or netboot or the CD ISO, you still have to run Signify by hand to verify that. Um, I'm not thrilled about this because I think uh, once you have OpenBSD installed, you should be able to just kind of upgrade uh, transparently without ever encountering this again. But um, I don't know, we're missing a little piece of code somewhere in base to kind of close the loop. Um, so if you compare to package add, so package add verifies packages. And when you do like package add dash U, um, your, it will replace all of your packages with new signed versions. And so it, package add is capable of upgrading. I guess basically the, the problem is um, a running OpenBSD system that doesn't know how to fetch uh, the components it needs to upgrade. Um, and so, uh, I don't know, I don't like it, but, um, so the, the hard part, so I guess this is where, yeah, you have to run Signify by hand, and so I try to keep that simple. So you download some files, and then there is a recipe in the man page, just like the one example is you run Signify dash V da da da, um, and then it verifies uh, that your BSD RD is for the next release, and then you can upgrade. Um, and oh, package add. So package add again is uh, works on the packages. The packages work on a very similar system. There's a SHA-256 uh, file in the package, which is a list of checksums of all the files in the package, and then we sign that. Um, and so this leveraged the existing package integrity uh, mechanism. Um, and the um, the one difference is that packages, the signature is inside the package. Um, there's no way actually, uh, I believe, to manually verify a package without trying to install it. Um, if you download a package, you'll just see firefox.tgz, um, but there's no firefox.tgz.sig file anywhere. Um, and nor is there a signed list of all the checksums of all the packages. Uh, the reason we're not doing that is the packages directory has way too much data and it takes basically like a full day to rsync uh, to a mirror. And so if you were trying to install a package, you would have a list of checksums, but on average half of those checksums would not match the packages on the mirror because they hadn't been rsynced yet. Um, and so instead the signatures are only entirely self-contained in the package and so that allows each file to be rsynced individually. Uh, the base release is a lot smaller, and so we can rsync that in a couple of minutes. Yes? So what, what about people putting the signatures actually in the tar block? Uh, but that's where they are. I mean, okay. yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yeah, it, that's part of the point is uh, it's, we try to be as transparent about this as possible. Um, we, we want it to work um, uh, without too much user intervention. Um, so, okay, so now the key rotation. So this is where uh, we expire the keys, if you will. Uh, there is one, oh, you wanna go? Yeah, sorry, um, so the kind of top level package metadata. Yes. Uh, that has a signature as well. Yes, the uh, description file and other stuff have checksums as well, and so they are, that's in the checksum, and then the checksum is signed. Um, there was a bug where the description was not being verified for a little short while, but I think it's been fixed. <laughs> and so you were talking about not wanting to have signatures for everything because some things you might have an inconsistent view. Of 
of right. the, the complete package set. But does that also mean that a malicious mirror would be able to replay an old signed package that has like a known vulnerability? Ah, excellent, yes. Um, so if your mirror, uh, well, okay, so the version number of the package is going to be included in the signature. Like Im implicitly, like it, it eventually gets in there. So basically, if uh, Firefox P2 goes out in the mirror and replaces Firefox P1, um, and you upgrade the P2, you cannot be downgraded to P1 um, because the package tools will not. Two is not, you know, going to one would be going backwards. Um, now a mirror can refuse to download the new signature or the new package. So it might deliberately keep outdated packages on the mirror and then you'll never upgrade. Uh, the package tools uh, though download a quirks file um, and so the quirks file is this magic special package which describes all of the ways that other packages are not normal. Uh, and uh, so the abnormalities in other packages uh, arise quite frequently. And so the Quarks package is updated on a pretty regular basis. Um, and so the package add tool now checks to see that the Quarks package that it fetches is not too far out of date. Um, and so there's still some window there, but uh, if you get a Quarks file from a year ago, the package tools are going to complain that your mirror is most likely out of date. Ah, so the Quarks, there's only one Quarks package, and so it doesn't have to match the particular package you're upgrading. It's all, package Add is always going to check the, the Quarks package first. Um, and so basically that is, serves as a timestamp of the mirror. Um, but so, for instance... Ah, yes, uh, no, if the, yes, if the, if it's not in there, then I think... Yeah, it probably won't update. Um, sorry. <laughs> uh, that, that's a good one. I mean, th there's only so much you can do there because I think, you know, basically, I mean, at some point, like, I can just unplug your internet cable and then you can't well, upgrade, well, so. Sure, <laughs> but I mean, the thing about port consistency is that you quite like it if, if somebody does freeze you, that they have to freeze you on everything so that it's more noticeable as opposed to having, like, just one package that gets frozen indefinitely. Yeah. I mean, that might be an argument for having a slightly different structure of the way that packages are distributed, where you have consistent snapshots, because then you can have a metadata file at the top that says, here's a consistent view, and I include you know, whatever the hashes of all the packages, and so then you can just replace a directory. Yes. Um, although, I guess I should mention, we don't build new packages for releases anyway, um, and so this is really only matters for snapshots. Um, and but yeah, okay, fair point. That's a known, I guess. Well, okay, now I now I know about it. <laughs> <laughs> Weak point. I, I, that, that's like uh, we didn't spend like the quarks thing was easy to do, and that's why uh, as we did it. Um, but I, I think I never really spent too much time thinking about like what if it's old. Like uh, you know, it, it's hard to know about things that you don't know about. That, that's just something that's difficult. Um, so there's a paper from a few years ago called Look in the Mirror, which is at HTTPS, okay. and that lists problems with lots of Linux and BSD package managers and kind of default gotchas. So as we updated our system, we wanted to pay attention to make sure that it's useful. Thanks. Um, what else? Oh, so OK, so key rotation. Um, so there's one key per release. Um, so everything, with everything related to 5.6 is going to be signed with the 5.6 key. Everything related to 5.7 is going to be signed with the 5.7 key. Um, and then, uh, so basically, this implicitly expires the keys after one year, um, where once 5, okay, yeah, 5.5 five is dead. So you should hopefully never see anything ever signed with a 5.5 five key again. Um, and so this kind of, you know, on the one hand, this kind of solves uh, the uh, compromise problem where, you know, if the 5.5 five key had been compromised at some point, well, now it's useless. And so, well, whatever, 
you know, have fun with it. Um, but uh, so how do we get the new keys out there? Um, so after each release, keys for the release after the next one are generated. Uh, so that's plus two. Um, I'll work the example. So after 5.6 was released, uh, new keys for 5.8 were generated. Um, and that way, the 5.8 keys then were included in the 5.7 release. Sorry, 6, 7, 8. Um, the, uh, basically, uh, if you upgrade every, every release, the, the current release you're running will have the keys for the next release. So when you go to upgrade, you can download the next release and verify it with the key that's already on your system. Um, and the keys are not signed directly, but there's an implicit chain here where uh, the key for the next release is included in the release, and that release has been signed. And so uh, if you somehow, you know, I think we, we started with this with 5.5. So if you installed 5.5, you got 5.5 and you got the 5.6 key. If you then, you could then use that 5.6 key to install 5.6, which got you the 5.7 key, which you could then use to download and verify 5.7, which gets you the 5.8 key. And this fall, you'll be able to download and verify 5.8 using that key. Um, and so this limits our exposure. Uh, and, uh, you know, we looked at a couple ways of doing this, and uh, I think some people are fans of key revocation. Uh, I don't think key revocation has ever really worked uh, in practice. And so, uh, and basically trying to revoke a key is like harder than, much harder than creating it, uh, and uh, generates a lot of failure modes uh, and, well, related issue. Then you have expired revocations, or you don't get the revocation, you don't know. So um, basically, um, worst case scenario, uh, a key is compromised. Uh, we say, sorry, uh, be careful, I guess. Um, and then six months later, there's a new release of OpenBSD with a new key, uh, and we can just forget about all the bad times. Um, <laughs> so, um, but I guess the, the one nice thing, though, is this also, um, you know, like I mentioned, if we ever decide that the ED25519 algorithm is not the algorithm for us. Uh, we've already have a now like tried and tested kind of method for rolling out a new algorithm. Uh, we can switch to like some of the like 400 bit keys or 400 bit curves uh, if that's really necessary. Uh, we just kind of, well, I have to add some code to Signify, then we wait a little bit for that code to trickle out, and then automatically new keys will get generated with the new algorithm. Um, so, what is, uh, okay, so the next key is already in the next release. Okay, uh, plus continuity. So now, uh, key infrastructure, uh, none. Um, so, the, uh, there are no uh, key servers, there is no web of trust. Uh, I do not have a personal Signify key, which I will use to assign the OpenBSD key. Um, and so um, you're like, so how do we get started? Well, it's kind of uh, it's chicken and egg uh, issue. So uh, you have a public key, which you might consider an egg, and you can use that to get OpenBSD, which is the chicken. And then uh, OpenBSD, the chicken, will has the key for the next release. So that's the egg. So the egg gives you a chicken, the chicken gives you an egg, the egg gives you a chicken. Um, now, so if you have either of those, you're all set. But what if you are, uh, you know, you walk into this room today and you've never used OpenBSD before and you're like, man, I, I want to try OpenBSD out. Um, how do people who have never installed OpenBSD before get started? Um, so that's uh, why the keys are small and dispersed. Uh, so there's a key right there. Uh, we put them on, as I mentioned, the CD label. We put them on the website. Uh, you can email me and I will send you a unsigned, unencrypted email back with a key. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, like at, at, at some point, you know, there's just kind of, there's only so many ways um, for an adversary to get in between you and the keys. Uh, and the more places we put the key, uh, the more likely it is that you will be able to find uh, a method that has not been interfered with, 
and it increases the risk that you will detect uh, any malfeasance. Um, you know, should anybody try funny business? And so uh, that does not mean that you should necessarily trust any random key you find on Twitter. Um, but if the key on Twitter, which is delivered over HTTPS, you know, so there, if you like HTTPS, uh, you can you know trust that. Um, you know, you can. That's basically our answer. Um, if you, uh, you know, I, I mean, I will, I will personally show you the key on my laptop if you really, really need to see it. Um, you know, I guess, and that's kind of the best we can do. Um, there's no uh, authority uh, that, that's going to deal with this. Have, have you put any thought towards or um, you know, kind of tinkered around with the idea of taking like a perspectives approach? Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with perspectives, but uh, like, say decentralized views of uh, what different actors believe the key should be and like coming to a consensus on that? Um, well, I'm not sure. I mean, the you are welcome to put the key on your website and you know become one of these people, <laughs> um, and you are welcome to run uh, you know a, a service that downloads the key from 20 places uh, and verifies. I, I think is, is that what you're getting at? Like, yeah, well, it was more, it was more the question of um, like, has, have you thought about that? Uh, we do not necessarily want to be doing that ourselves. Gotcha. Um, I think that's certainly uh, a, a key verification uh, effort that is community driven uh, would be welcome. Um, you know, basically, I, I think, um, you know, like I mentioned, once you get OpenBSD installed once, um, you're, you're pretty much set. And so this is really only a first time issue. And, um, you know, then you need to, I don't know, buy a CD and really weigh the pros and cons of whether somebody's going to fuck with your mail and, you know, their chances of getting away with that. Um, and then, you know, you know, have your neighbor buy the CD and trade you with him or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so you go here. Okay, so conclusions, uh, questions. Um, so. I think uh, one unanswered question, which I thought when I first outlined this talk was going to be, you know, like, why didn't we do this before? Um, and uh, I was going to start with that and say, uh, the answer will be obvious by the time I get to the end of the talk. Um, it's probably not obvious because uh, I've mostly focused on what Signify does uh, and not so much all of the pain we went through uh, deploying it in the first, I would say, three months. Um, but the early releases, like we didn't quite have the key rotation figured out. Uh, we didn't know which keys uh, were. We didn't know like which machine was going to generate the keys and sign uh, sets, and so that required a whole bunch of uh, work uh, on Theo's end, where he had to kind of rewire his network to create a new kind of like diode signing machine, which can sign things, but otherwise isn't able to talk out to the outside world, um, or more specifically, the outside world is not able to talk to it. Um, and so uh, that's our uh, hardware security module is a, uh, I don't know, it's like a 1U Dell with a one-way Ethernet cable. <laughs> um, but, uh, and so there, there's a lot of like frustration getting going with that, and um, I didn't want to focus too much on it because I think uh, as an end user, you know, you, you probably at this point don't care what happened a year ago and um, you know we're, we're never going to do this again um, so kind of the, the lessons learned were all kind of one-off but um, it was like oh man I wrote this I wrote Signify in like uh, a couple of days it, it was very fast and I'm like wow we're done and then <laughs> like three months later um, Theo was like, why isn't this not verifying? And I was like, oh, you signed it with the wrong key. And then like we had, because uh, in our old days we were just kind of experimenting, we, we had, um, and the very first versions of the keys did not have that little pretty comment telling you what, them, what was in them. It was just 32 bytes of base64 data uh, of just the key. And so you could sign anything with anything and then try to verify it. And uh, we got all sorts of mismatches because we had way too many keys running around. Um, and the good news is that kind of just all solved itself um, where the, um, once we had a process in place, 
um, then we didn't have too many keys running around. But uh, I don't know. So uh, if you're working on something like this, um, I guess you know just kind of take it slow uh, and think about your process and think about you know next steps uh, as you go. And so I think that was uh, one of the lessons that we learned. Um, otherwise, done. Questions? So uh, <clears throat> I'm going to be looking at um, implementing soon, within the next six months, hopefully, um, uh, digital signatures for help. OK. Um, what? People love to bring this up. Um, <laughs> Our official position is uh, it's more like snake oil than anything. So we, there are no plans to embed signature verification in the kernel for executables. Well, right. I'm not talking about OpenBSD. I'm talking about a different project. Oh, yeah. No, no. I, I know. OK. Oh, sorry. I, I shouldn't have cut you off. <laughs> what, kind, what, kinds, um, what kinds of preliminary tasks would be involved into getting at least the, the underlying crypto algorithms and such in a kernel, like FreeBSD, for example. OK. Um, so Before you answer, you only get one last answer. OK. Uh, I would look at the Signify source. It's got all of the ED code in it. Uh, and we if deft it so that it verifies only, which reduces the code, the size of the code substantially. So the, the signing requires like a whole bunch of curve operations. Verification is very simple, and so you can fit. It's only about like 9k static or something, uh, which would easily fit in a kernel. Um, so self-contained, no open SSL or anything. No. Uh, yeah. So I mean, the only thing you need is well, we, we need the base 64 code, but you, you don't even need that. Um, like literally, it, it's there's a sign function and a verify <laughs> function. All right. Oh, yeah, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs>